let's give a mighty shout to the King of Kings. Not a loud, not a little shout, a mighty shout. Come on. to learn to love you well just to learn to love you well to be faithful day by day like you are to us we praise you Lord for this opportunity to hear more about you we depend on the power of the Holy Spirit we need you God big time we need you so much and we pray that you would set people free this morning I ask you great Holy Spirit that you would do a work inside the human hearts that only you can do by revelation. Yeah. Australia, all of the earth. We pray, Lord, for the fruit of your blood to come into the earth in a greater way. Father, please give your son's blood everything it paid for. Everything he paid for, Father. Give your son's blood. Give him, Lord Jesus, the souls that he was worthy of sacrificing for. Give him, Lord, the multitudes, Father, Give him, Psalm 2 is actually about the Lord. Give the Lord Jesus, the nations of the earth. He is calling to you, Father, saying, give me these ones. And use us, Lord, to bring in this harvest. We love you, Jesus. We want to love you, hands and feet, knees, shoulders, what what was it, toes and whatever. (laughs) Heads, shoulders, knees and toes. I haven't heard that in a while. But fully consume us. (laughs) thank you Lord in Jesus name amen would you look at somebody and would you just tell them you look like Jesus (laughs) oh yeah you were created in his image usually don't do uh, introduction stuff because <clears throat> I try and keep the focus and attention on the person of God. But it doesn't matter. We're not religious. So um, I'll introduce myself. I'm a Christian, <laughs> which means I'm, I'm actually trying to walk like Christ. I'm not very good at it yet, but I'm getting there slowly. But I have zero intention this morning of impressing you. I'm here for one, I'm here for really two reasons, actually. Uh, I'm here because the Lord sent me and for my friend, Pastor Corey, because I love him and Pastor Simone so much and their family so much. I actually am going to apply for a job to try and draft his son as his agent. But, um, <laughs> but I love them deeply and I felt the Lord really just connected my heart to, to these guys. So that's why I'm here. But the second reason I'm here, I'm here for you to be set free. And so... I don't care if you remember me or if you remember this message, but I do care that you remember what God does this morning. This will not be a morning session that you are used to. This will be a morning session where demons come out quickly. This will be a morning session where, um, so if you feel uncomfortable with that, the door is there, you feel free. Um, But I tell people, please don't go home with the Klingon, you know. Don't, Don't go home with the devil if you don't have to. You know, go home free, amen. And I felt in worship, I was just kneeling down and 
just kneeling in worship. And I'm not into, I'm not one of these sort of shofar dudes and, and flag guys, but I love those people. Um, but I'm not, I haven't, I don't know which mountain I need to pray on all that stuff. I don't know all that stuff. But, but I do know when I hear God's voice and I heard God say the spirit of Jezebel. So I know to come against that this morning. So, so I'm headed right with the Holy Spirit to whatever controlling demon is controlling you. And specifically, the control is the control of fear. I hate fear. I can't stand it if I feel the enemy has power over my will. I, I don't like that. I'm not, I'm actually, a, um, I'm, I'm a Christian, as I said, I'm a minister and, um, you know, and yeah, I'm a pastor now <laughs> and uh, it's much harder than filling stadiums, I can tell you, <laughs> but um, it's more of a work than, than filling these arenas. I don't fill them anyway, God does, but um, it's an amazing work uh, that we get to be a part of. But one thing that I'm very passionate about is I'm passionate about people leaving um, personalities, titles, things they've been taught. Um, old dead religious mindsets they've held onto for years that cripple them in the nature of Jesus inside them. Because I, I've been reading this New Testament for a while and I've never found an introvert in here or an extrovert or a CDH45 personality. I never found one. I just found people that were filled with God. And, uh, and the ones that weren't filled with God, God helped them to be more filled. So uh, I'm not against that. My assistant, who's like a genius, says I'm a 70% introvert. If I go to, usually I go to a conference, I'll sit in the hotel for literally half the day. Uh, I enjoy to be alone. Um, I don't know why. I just enjoy that. But when I'm with people, especially these guys, I light up a bit, especially with Pastor Corey. He feels like my, my literal brother. And we talk about revival, soul winning. Today, we we're talking about some funny stuff in the upstairs room, and um, I won't get into that. But... Um, but I, I come alive around their family, people like that, people like you. I, I love that people. But I love to be alone. And, and, uh, and people I meet all over the world come up to me at the prayer lines. They say, would you pray for me? I, I'm an introvert. And I'm like, well, I don't know how to pray for that. But I, I, I think God made you to kind of refuel alone. But I can pray for you to be filled with the Spirit. See, God didn't create introverts. He created sons and daughters, which means he created people who are in covenant with their dad. When you're in, you're in covenant with your dad, you should not be controlled by anything but your father. Yeah. Jesus was not controlled by someone else's will, but the Lord's will. Yeah. And, uh, and so what I mean is, I don't mind all those books. My, my assistant and all our staff, we go through these things. We have these things called G to G meetings, glory to glory meetings, where we sit them down. How were you six months ago? How are you now? We try and take our team from glory to glory. And it's really cool. And I love how we do all that stuff. And we go through little manuals and stuff like that. And I love it all. But at the end of the day, a person must be filled with God. I was driving on the autobahn. I was talking to a friend of mine, Jeremy Riddle, about this. And, and we were talking about um, all the structures and systems of church. And I was driving on the German autobahn, and the Lord spoke to me very loudly. And sometimes when you're on the autobahn and doing 180, 200 kilometers, you hear the Lord differently. Um, <laughs> your prayer life definitely changes. You pray in tongues more. And, uh, and you're sharp and alert, you know. And I heard the Lord say, Ben... He said, I don't fill a structure, I take over a man. And the structures are made to facilitate how God takes over us. They're all there to help us to become more possessed by God. It's not there for us to kind of cling to things that we learn or structures we learn or principles we learn. The principles are ultimately to possess us with more of God. And so this morning I felt to minister on this wise on breaking the fear of man that it would be broken in you today and you would be delivered of any evil spirit that has controlled your life. Sometimes we think Jezebel means like there's some lady who's here and she wears kind of like a black garment, sits up the back of the church and curses the church. That's weak stuff. That's nothing. You can just cast that devil out quick. That's really fast. But the entrenching of a mindset of fear, that's what I'm going to plow into with the Holy Ghost today, okay? So let's open our Bibles. Who's got their Bible here? Yeah. Wonderful. Who's got their iPhone Bible? Who's in sin and they have a Samsung? We have a prayer line for you up the right side here. If you have a Samsung, we can get you delivered of that as well. I'm just joking. One time I was in Asia and I said that. That was the wrong place to say that. How dare you speak against Samsung? <laughs> All right, Galatians chapter 1. You ready? The Word of God is the best preacher by far. We need a Bible revival. The Scriptures are so pertinent. 
to your growth and development. I tell people, you eat how many times a day? Three times, plus snacking in the middle. I snack a lot in the middle. Um, we even, I, love, I love this conference because there's snacks under the chair. It's wonderful. But uh, not just mints, snacks. That's pretty amazing. So I, I snack a lot. But I tell people, I'm like, you realize you can't survive eating one meal of five minutes a day on God's word, right? You cannot survive that way. You'll be spiritually malnutritioned. And you know what the first sign of death is in a patient in hospital or a sign that they are morbidly sick is they lose hunger. That's the first sign. When you lose hunger for God's presence, hunger for the word. See, the word produces the word. So you've got to be here a lot, all right? That's just a side note. All right, let's go to verse 8, Galatians chapter 1. But even if we or an angel from heaven doesn't say from hell, even a holy thing that seems very good, if those people, if they preach any other gospel to you than that which was preached to you, let him be accursed. I'm going to highlight that word for a second. Accursed, that's a very serious statement. Can you imagine you're sitting with your senior pastors and they, say, they sit down with you and say, what did that guy preach to you? And you tell them. And then Pastor Corey says, okay, we curse that message and we curse that person. That's strong language. This is Paul the Apostle talking. One of the most careful orators, scribes of the whole word of God, basically in the New Testament, or half the word of the New Testament. And he says, let that person be a curse. And then if he doesn't make it clear enough there, let's look at verse 9. He says, as we said before, yeah, like three seconds ago, now I say it again. If anyone preaches another gospel to you than that which you've received, let him be, say it, accursed. 95% Jesus is 100% not Jesus. A Jesus with no judgment, a Jesus with no heaven and hell, a Jesus with no burning conviction that souls must be saved, not some universal garbage Jesus, a real Jesus, one who's alive, one who's intimate with you, a faithful shepherd, high priest, stands in front of the throne of God with the burning flames of fire. Uh, Pastor Corey and I were talking last night about this uh, uh, animation last night. It was so holy, seeing that chair, the white throne. Can you imagine looking into the eyes of the Messiah, blazing? It says, the whole of the earth and the heavens flee from the wrath of the face of the Lord. Revelation. This person is gigantic. He holds the universe together, yet he kisses your forehead at night. He's so precious. So Paul's like, don't let anyone mess this up. If that person messes it up, let him be a curse. And then he goes on, verse 10, to share the reason why people change the gospel, why they change who they are. He shares the reason. Let's read it, verse 10. It says, for now do I persuade men, or God, do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I want to slow this down. If I still, okay, I'm going to modernize this. Forgive me, Father, if it's wrong. If I need to please you in everything I say, Paul says, I will stop being God's servant. What does that mean? I will tear myself from intimate union of being led by the Spirit, led by the true message, led by my Messiah. And it says, I will no longer be a bond servant of Christ because I have to please you because I have a problem. Because my value is rooted in what you think of me. And Paul said, the people that change the message are cursed because that's what they're doing. They're changing the gospel. They're failing to preach the gospel. They're living with a mindset of the fear of man. Because of that, they can't serve two people. So in other words, Jesus says here, you've got to make a choice. You've got to choose one person serving freedom serving him or serving fear. Some people in their mind, they, that becomes a major equation to them. So they're like, that's too much for me. I, I can't try and fully serve Jesus and never have fear. Jesus didn't say never have fear. He said, you can't serve them both. It's the same with love. He said, you can't love mammon and God. Remember that? It's the same thing. He didn't say you won't have fear. Now, I want to tell you, like, I'm an evangelist, true. I love preaching the gospel. But I had a major, major stronghold of the fear of man. On the street, I was okay. I would go up to people and preach. But inside church, in this setting, I was terrified. I was terrified to speak on a microphone. I was afraid and claustrophobic of flying. This is all as a believer. I wouldn't want to preach at all. I, I would be totally fine with the guy at the cafe. He's like, get hey, mate, how are you? I'm like, hey, bro, do you know Jesus? I would be totally fine because that person can offer me nothing. 
but there was something inside me that had a, there was a need inside me that was feeding a value system in an unhealthy way. Now, God made us for encouragement. <laughs> he made you to hug your friend and go, you're amazing, bro. He made that in us. It's, it's a need we have. I, I've heard people go the other way with like, we don't need anything but God. Well, try that for a while. You'll probably be pretty lonely. You know, we do need encouragement. We need each other. We're a collective body. It says we have the mind of Christ. Not one of us. All of us need each other, right? But the thing is this. Many people don't just learn to, to get that encouragement. They learn to anchor their identity. And that's what I was subtly doing. And I'll show you what it produced in me. So I was bold in the street. I go, hey, bro, God loves you. I'd be preaching the gospel here in Melbourne. I remember preaching out the front of a strip club sometimes, watching guys going to go, you don't want to go in there. I see you've got a wedding ring on. I was bold. I'm like, you don't want to go in there, bro. I said, God loves you. Go home to your wife. Start reading the Bible. It was very bold. But then when I came into church, I, I didn't realize how deep this was anchored inside my soul, but it was in me, this, this thing of trying to make sure that the person that I was fit in with everybody here. And, and I had this deep, deep insecurity. And I tried to be other people. Like I, I'd see how a dude dressed or see how a guy acted. And I'd kind of try and sort of adopt that into my life. Let me just make a statement to you before we get into this. If two of you become identical in this earth, one of you is unnecessary here. <laughs> one of you doesn't belong here. God didn't make you somebody else. God loves the grace he gave you. He likes the personality he has in you and, and he flows through that. You're a unique vessel, but you make up a greater whole. And so I didn't have this fear in the street, but all of a sudden I went to Bethel and, and uh, I, I got delivered of a lot of stuff there. I had some porn problems and just different things like this. As, as a believer, I kept slipping into sin. I went there and the Lord really powerfully, supernaturally yielded me. Uh, I could just say it like that. He yielded me. I also did a long fast and there was a 40-day thing and all that stuff. And, and I really was bent by the hand of God when I was in Bethel. And it's so glorious in Bethel, you know, the worship's amazing. It's just like, it's like Christian Disneyland, you know? And, and so it's miracles happening everywhere. And, and, uh, and I had the, the privilege of when I was in third year, um, this kind of mentor sort of started to take a liking to me and, and scoped me out a bit. And one day he asked me, he said, hey, Ben, he goes, do you want to sit on the front row? Now, Bethel's a mega church, okay? 9,000 people or so in the church. And I was like, me? And I mean, I went to Bethel kind of just like, God, help me be a Christian, literally. I wasn't going there like, oh, I'm gonna take over and have a big ministry. I really didn't believe that about myself at that point. But I did believe that God could use me and that I could speak and preach the gospel. But I wasn't trying. I, I didn't have any major ambition. I just was like, God, I'd like to be a healthy Christian, like one that doesn't sin. That would be a fantastic, like, a, a fantastic year for me without sin. And, and so I was completely delivered. But then I became faithful to start preaching and serving. And I love serving there. And, and I love serving our, our um, you know, the mums and dads house, what their vision was. And, and so one day, this guy, Chris, he says to me, now, I don't know our senior leaders very well at this point. He says to me, he goes, would you like to sit in the front row with me? I'm like, me? And he goes, he goes, yeah, buddy, sit in the front row next to me. I'm like, next to Chris Valden and Bill and everybody. And he goes, yeah. And I'm like, okay. And, and I got there and I'm like, you know, I'm like I was so nervous, but so excited. I'm like, and I'm sitting right there with Chris Vallard and all these dudes, you know, all these like major Christian body of Christ leaders. And I'm like a little third year student. And I get there. And so I'm just kind of excited and worshiping and I'm watching my friend who's a staff member and evangelist there, Chris Overstreet, and I'm watching him worship and I'm kind of like, I couldn't take my mind off the fact that I was sitting on the front row. I'm like, people behind me probably saying, hey, good to see you guys, you're third years back there. You know, <laughs> I was just so excited. And I didn't realize that I was about to have a life-changing encounter. I had no idea. I literally was just like having a great old time. And then all of a sudden, uh, Bill, he preached this amazing message as always, and he came off the stage and when he walked off the stage, he came down like this. Sorry, cameramen, I love you. Um, he came down and he started shaking all his staff members' hands. Just gentle, saying, God bless you, have a wonderful Sunday. God bless you, have a wonderful Sunday. And now I'm number seven. And I'm like this. <laughs> I'm ready, you know? I'm really excited. I was like, I was like Bill John's going to shake my hand. I'm going I'm to say, have a wonderful Sunday, Bill, you know? I was so excited. And, and I was like, he's going, I'm gonna, you know, he's going to know me. And so he, he goes down the row and, and he's a gentle guy, just so full of love, but he's also full of God, discerning, you know? And so I'm getting ready and he goes, God bless you. God bless you, wonderful Sunday. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And Chris is next to me. And I'm like, 
And he goes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And he gets to me and he goes, he pulls his hand away from me. He looked me in the eyes, pulls his hand away and walks away. And now I'm like this. I'm like, <laughs> and my heart's like this. And then all of a sudden my mind, very rational, very peaceful, he's like, he hates you. He's seen a post you did on Facebook. He doesn't like what you stand for. He heard about your doctrine. Your doctrine's incorrect. You did something last week. He doesn't like, he saw you pray for a guy. You were too loud when you prayed. You should have had more self-control. My mind was in this crazy, crazy place. Anybody ever had that? Yeah, see, let's tell the truth today. That's good. So your mind is just going nuts. You know, you're like, what the heck does he think of me? And in that very weird state, I turn to Chris. I go, Chris. I go, Chris. He goes, hey, buddy. You know, he's just chilling. I said, Chris, Bill Johnson didn't shake my hand. He goes, I'm sure he didn't see you, buddy. I said, Chris. He went one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm the seventh. He looked me in the eye, drew his hand back. It was very detailed. And, and he's like, he goes, he goes, bro, you're probably overthinking it. I said, I'm not. Eyeballs, <laughs> hand, no hand, you know? And so I was like, so I decided I know what to do. I'll follow him to the car. <laughs> Bad idea. Now you think about this, you're laughing, but how many of you have gone on this train of instant self-paranoia, self-punishment, blah, 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 whatever it might be, and all of a sudden, you're down there somewhere in your head. You're thinking of the conversation. I should have said this when they said that. And you're reverbing it all in your brain at night, trying to figure out how you would have won. That's so stupid, but we do it all the time. But I didn't realize God was, a bit, he was literally about to take the nest off these ants, this stronghold I had. I didn't realize I had it because I was bold in other places of my life. It's a funny thing to me. Many people can be bold singing at church and they can be here like, duh, 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 you know, really crazy. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Except when God says, stop that lady at 7-Eleven. <laughs> you know, whoa. Like we're bold here, but then at 7-Eleven. Hey, 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 uh, God loves you. <laughs> and we walk off like a Christian penguin. It's awkward. I remember one time I said to a guy, I go, do you have knee problems? And he goes, no. And I said, okay. I just left. <laughs> Can you imagine the thoughts in his head? He goes home to his wife. There was this young guy. He just walked up to me in the street. What did, what did he say? He just said, do you have knee problems? And he turned away like a ghost. <laughs> what does that mean? What does that mean? It's dumb. Fear is so dumb. Fear reduces your spiritual intelligence big time. So I'm out in the car park. Now, looking for Bill, bad move. And I'm just gonna say to him, hey, Pastor Bill, is there anything I've done against you? My name's Ben, uh, you know, you probably heard about me and you know, what have I done wrong? I, I, did you see a post on Facebook? <laughs> Who gives a rip? But you give a rip when you're in fear. You give a rip when there's a stronghold in you. You give a rip when there's a part of your life that is sourcing identity from the wrong place. So I got out there, and praise the Lord, he got into his car before I got there. So he starts driving past, and I'm like, ha, bless you, good Sunday. I walk back toward the church, kind of a big building, you know. I walk back in the car park like this, I'm like, what is going on? And I felt God was looking at me. You ever had that feeling? You ever had the feeling like you're in, you're in your bed and you just have a sense that Jesus is just looking right at you in that moment? I felt the Father was looking at me, and he began to speak to me, and he said, Ben, I need to speak to you about what you trust in. And all of a sudden I begin to remember times I changed who I was. I remember times where someone would ask me a question or I'd be in a conversation, for example, with some powerful leaders or men, women of God, and they would start to speak in a way that I thought was absolutely against the spirit. And I wouldn't say anything. I would cower inside. I specifically remember one conversation where these guys were complaining, well-known ministers. They were complaining, and I'm a young guy, so who am I to speak? And these guys were saying, can you believe I flew all the way across America, like three, four-hour flight, and they only gave me $2,000 to preach? And in my heart, I'm like, oh, young kid, pure, just trying to be a preacher, just trying to love God. And I'm like, oh, I feel this, I should say, but don't you think 
I didn't want to correct and rebuke, but I just wanted to say, but don't you think we should do it for God anyway? And, you know, but I couldn't. I was like, shut. I was frozen. What does the Bible say in Proverbs? The fear of man is a snare. What does that mean? What you really think, what you really want to do when God really speaks and you want to obey, you can't do it because there's something that stops you. You freeze. I remembered all these circumstances and I recalled going to the largest meeting I ever preached at in the US. It was about two or 3,000 people. It was in Indiana. And for me as a, a young believer, I was like, this is phenomenal. I was by the side of the stage and the pastor was introducing me and before I got up, my heart, even when I was sitting, my heart was thumping. I mean, I don't mean like a little bit to the point where I thought I'm going to faint. So I rebuked the demon. I said, get out of me, spirit. Now get off me. I started to rebuke this spirit. I said, get off right now. It got heavier like this. And I look, I'm looking at the crowd and I'm, it's like heavier. And I'm like, oh, God. I said, God, help. God, help. And it didn't leave. And I was standing right there. And then the Holy Spirit interrupted me. It wasn't a demon at all. He said to me, Ben, people only get this nervous when they're about to put on a performance. And I knew, I remembered all these times. I'm like, oh, I've been doing this, God. A part of my soul is falsely validated. A part of my obedience to you is connected to what everybody will think of that obedience. A part of my boldness is connected and linked. Now, I'm not talking about being dishonorable and saying, I'll do whatever I want. I have no fear of man. That's not how we live. It doesn't, life doesn't function that way. But what I was doing with Bill and with all these other people, and he knows this, by the way, he, Bill knows exactly what happened because several years later, I had the courage to tell him about it. But it took me a few years. But I found out Bill, when he went down the line, you know, if I, if I do this right now, if I say, who am I looking at right now? Put your hand up right there. If I'm looking at you right now, put your hand up. See, there's two people put their hand up at the same time. He looked past me in his peripheral vision right beside my face. He never saw me, but God knew that would happen. So he could pull something out of me that was a major hindrance to my obedience to God. And so I had an area of my thinking that was cursed because it was too attached to people. And some of you have the same area, but it's not maybe in church. Maybe in church, you're, you're really comfortable. I wasn't. But maybe for you, it's you walk down the street and there's someone coming and God says, speak to that person. You know, you're walking like this and God says, speak to that girl. And you go, and your heart's thumping all of a sudden. And you go, which girl? And he goes, that girl. And you go, which one, Lord? And he goes, that one. You go, it's too late now, God. <laughs> How many of you have done that? You done that? It's like four people put their hand up. I believe more did that. You want to see how committed God is to his harvest? You want to see how committed God is to breaking fear out of your life? and literally ripping it out of the root system of who you are, I'll show you, ready? Put your hand up if the Holy Spirit has ever spoken to you to stop and tell someone about Jesus. Put your hand up, look at that, look around. Every hand. I guess this is just a church of only five-fold evangelists. This is not about evangelism. Jesus said the purpose for the cross was freedom. From what? From a system that held us in bondage. People say, well, I don't have the fear of death. That's an interesting one to doctrinally unpack because some people literally don't have the fear of death. They have a kamikaze mindset. They're not afraid of dying. But fear itself, let's just take the word death away for a second. They live in fear. And fear itself produces death. It's the death of callings. It's the death of, I tell you right now, the richest place in the earth, the richest place is not Saudi Arabian oil wells. The richest place in the earth is the graveyard. That's where all the callings of God, all the things that, that could have come into the earth, all the revivals, but they were hindered. And it's usually by one of two things. It's usually, uh, three things, sorry. It's usually by one of three things. Disobedience and, and an unholiness to God. An un unholy person. Or it's by the fear of man, or it's by busyness. We have an acceptable Christian modern sin called busyness. We celebrate it, you're so busy, well done. You're busy doing everything but God's will. We get very busy. But for some people, the biggest stronghold in busyness and disobedience, because they, they're holy, they're trying to do the right thing like I was, but they have the fear of man. How do you know you have that in your life? You think all the time about what people think of you. 
That's how you know. Your thoughts, are, how do they think of me? If Pastor Corey walks past you and he, and he looks at you just like this, glances at you and doesn't say hi, are you thinking, what, what does he think? What did I do wrong? What did I? Because you shouldn't be thinking like that. You should be believing the best about your pastor. He loves you. He's busy. Bill Johnson loved me. Busy guy. You know, kind of a little bit busy leading 9,000 or so people. But I didn't live that way. In my heart, I live with this, this posture that had me captive to performing certain, in certain ways for people and to reducing the boldness of Christ inside my life. So I'll tell you what happened right after this. I started to fast and pray. I said, God, you need to rip this out of my life. I didn't realize how much of a captive I am to the fear of people's opinion. I said, you need to rip it out of my life quickly. I realized looking back, I was like, I would scroll through comments, making sure most of the comments were positive. I couldn't stand a negative one. Why? I'm feeding there. Guys, we have marginalized this glorious blood of Jesus identity of perfect sonship. We've marginalized it down to a tap on a screen. It is a joke. We need to come out of all that crap. We need to come back to what it means to innocently fall in love with God. And, and, and God will give you major, major influence. God will do that for you. He'll give you major influence. But I begin to fast and pray. Because around the same time all this was happening, I had this vision of a stadium in Nuremberg, Germany that Hitler used to use to proclaim a demonic false gospel, an idolatry that set all these people on fire in, in a demonic way to go and destroy Europe. I felt God saying, I want you to take this area. And I'd never done events like that before. I did one tiny one in the Philippines one time. I had no favor in Germany. The church average size is between 40 and 50 people there. I, I didn't know any leaders there. I knew nothing there. If I had have still had that fear of man in me, I would not have survived. And I'll tell you that in just a second. But what happened was I began to fast and pray. And I said, God, you need to bend my will. I want to be anchored in you. And I think I was on day 20 something. And the Holy Spirit said, turn to the book of Jeremiah. Now, usually when I go to different books, I've done this a thousand times with God. Like, God, I need to hear you. I go, speak to me, Lord. And I flip it open. It says, kill a hundred foxes and hang them backwards on a fence. <laughs> Anyone ever had that happen? You ever had that? You ever, put your hand if you had that before, right? Or you're like, Jesus, please. Just one chapter in verse. And he's like, Deuteronomy 17, four. And it says, great judgment will come to your house or something. <laughs> now I'm very careful. I'm like, am I really hearing that? You know, so when God said Jeremiah, my mind was like weeping prophet, pretty strong rebukes in that book. So I was thinking, okay, what is God going to speak to me? So I literally opened to the book of Jeremiah. And as I opened it, you know, you kind of find the book and you flick. I flicked open to Jeremiah 17 and my eyes fell on verse five. It was exactly what God wanted to say to me. Here's what it says. It says, cursed is the man. Remember what Galatians said? Accursed. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. And it says he makes flesh his strength. He's only, guys, are you only as strong as the people that like you? Are you only as strong as the people that validate who you are? What about Jesus in you? You don't have anybody out there cheering you on in the street. You don't have anybody out there when God says, do this for me. You just have God, which is more than enough. Oh, but Lord, I read this uh, thing about personalities and God's like, don't, please do not tell me that. I made every person alive. Please don't tell me. Why would the Holy Spirit tell you to do something that your personality isn't used to doing? I'll tell you why. Because God is glorified in your weakness. God gets glory when you can't do stuff. Oh, Lord, I can cook this soup for you. He's like, that's wonderful, but you can't multiply it to a thousand soups. I can. Give me the soup. I cook this bread loaf. Give it to me. Watch. They're everywhere. God is multiplied inside our weakness. God is strengthened inside someone who can't, can't speak, and the next minute they're the most powerful preacher in the world. That's how God brings glory to himself. And that's how he, he actually he sets you free that way. And, and so I begin to read this. And as my eyes are scaling the page, I'm like, that's me. 
My thinking is cursed. The will of God in me is limited because I care too much about what everyone thinks of me. I've made people my strength. It's that simple. Bill Johnson is a strength to me, but he's not Jesus. The ministry is a strength to me, but it's not Jesus. This microphone, this, this is not the definition of Christian success. It's a byproduct, but it's not the definition. So I realized I was in a stronghold of thought, which meant that I preached only what was probably popular. Or I remember literally preparing, thinking of the faces. How will they like when I say that? I used to think of these one-liners like, whoa, man. Whoa. People do it. They make it rhyme all the time. You know, whoa, God isn't just presence, He's power. You know, they make things rhyme with letters. and It's all stupid. Because, the, you know what I'm saying by that? They go, they, go, they go, it's not just arrows, it's archways. They make it with the same letters and stuff. It's, it's all dumb. Like, honestly, it's dumb. You don't see Jesus doing that. Jesus didn't go, it's not just John, it's Joey. You know? He didn't do that. It's not just baptism, it's blessed. Whoa. Because he didn't need to make things rhyme and sound a certain way. He didn't need to get your affirmation every three seconds because he was correctly connected to the vine. There wasn't a big hook inside of him that was connected too much for valuing people's opinion. This is the major antithesis of why people don't preach the gospel. They're going down the street, a stranger's there. What will they think of me? <laughs> Who cares? People come to me, man, could you pray for me? I was rejected. I'm like, yes, I'll pray for you. Father, give them 10 more rejections until they stop caring what every human alive thinks of them. Please, God, let them be rejected. What a gift. What a gift. The spirit of rejection. Listen, if you were abused as a kid, if you were hit, my dad used to go nuts on me. Rejection's serious. It's real. The reason I had this thing of the need of fathers and others to validate me was because there was a root. I'm not against that. But rejection is actually a gift. Because you find out what's inside. You find out where you're rooted. Rooted and grounded in. You should know that one. <laughs> I'll give you a second chance like it never happened before. <laughs> Rooted and grounded in, where does that love come from? From Yahweh, from our Father. Okay, you love me as I am. You're here with me on the street. Yep. If they reject you, it's not you they're rejecting, it's the message. Most of the time they just think it's dead religious Jesus anyway. Most of the time they're not rejecting you. I've had some funny ones though. Oh, I've had some funny ones. God has stretched my capacity to be bold remarkably. I hope he never does to you what he's done to me. But he's fathered me because he saw that, oh, Ben's pretty bold on the street, but I wasn't bold in church. I was very safe, very protected. Wouldn't talk about certain subjects because I wanted to be invited back. <laughs> That's just being honest. Just being honest with you. <laughs> so I said, Father, you need to rip this out of me. You need to make me more bold. So I took on Germany, a major leader, a prophet at the same time, pointed me out at Bethel and said, the Lord is saying, he's going to use you to raise up Jesus freaks in Germany. And, and it was a confirmation. And I was like, that's amazing. Well, Eric Johnson heard him say that. And he said, he goes, Ben, come to the green room later of this conference. Tell that guy the vision you saw about Hitler's fields and Hitler's stadium. Tell the guy. I told the guy the vision 30 minutes later. I said, bro. I said, it's so amazing. You, you prophesied exactly what God had placed in my heart. I said, I want to say thank you to you for being so bold. And, and this guy, he says, oh, okay. And I said, yeah, I feel God is going to fill stadiums. God is going to save thousands in Germany where there's so much problem, so many dead religions there, so much stuff where they don't believe the gospel and, and there's not, churches are not growing. I said, God is going to do something. He showed me. And he looked me up and down. He assessed my beard. He assessed the way I was dressed. And he looked at me and he went, the same prophets, 30 minutes earlier, said the Lord was, is going to do this. He looked at me and he's like, well, I've been to Germany many times. The German church is very hard to work with. And he said, and he goes, you really need the favor. And he goes, it's probably not the right timing. And I'm like, in my head, I'm, and I didn't argue. I didn't know what to say. But I remember walking out of the building of Bethel. And again, just confused. 
And the Spirit of God spoke to me because God had been dealing with me in these areas. And I started walking and he said, are you gonna believe him or me? I said, I believe you. Now he's a man, he's flawed, he can make mistakes. I've made mistakes like that. We all presume things of each other, but we can't presume what the Spirit is or is not depositing inside a person. And so I began to take on this journey and, and our first event, which is I had no, you have to understand, zero favor. Imagine you just going to a Western country, like you moved straight away, but not, a, like a, not America where there's a lot of Christians. You went straight away from right now to Austria and you just rocked up, started telling a few pastors about your vision and nine months later, or a little, little more than nine months, 27,000 people show up in the first event. That has to be the Lord. It has to be. But I would not have obeyed correctly a leader from Germany flew all the way to Bethel to convince some of the senior team of Reading, don't let this young guy do this event. If I was accursed in my thinking, I would quit. Oh, I'm so sorry. Does it, is, does it offend you guys? I'm sorry if I'm treading on the wrong territory. I heard God. You hear God. Now, before with Bill, with all these people, I used to want them to see me, to see me worshiping. I used to stack the chairs like this. I'd move the chair like this going... I'm going to be a servant. You don't be a servant so people see you serve. You be a servant to serve. But I had all this stuff in my thinking that was accursed. And so I was changing who I am. What's the first thing you lose when you start to change who you are? Number one, you lose authenticity. Number two, you lose intimacy with God. Why? Because you're confused in your thoughts about what others think of you and you can't hear the clear thoughts of God. Number three, you lose obedience. You won't take risks. We want Germany to be saved. You guys want Melbourne to be saved. Australia, right? I want Australia for Jesus as well. This is my country too. But how are we gonna see Australia saved? Oh, sovereign Lord, move. And he's like, I'm trying to move you for years. I love what Pastor Corey said last night. It is a partnership between the hunger of man drawing on God's heart and then us obeying when he says do something. Like that man Valdez who got on a boat. We won't see this country saved unless we're free of fear. And some of you, it's so deeply entrenched that it actually has manipulated your personality. It has jezebel you. It's made you a different person. And that's why in worship, you're like this. Thank you, Lord. You don't want anyone next to you to hear you sing. That's why you're afraid if your voice sounds stupid, it sounds dumb. That's why you're worried what the person on the street thinks of you who you've never met they've never met you, the worst thing they can say to you is, no, thank you, I don't like that. That's literally the worst. And your mind is paralyzed by what they could do to you. That has to be witchcraft. That has to be manipulative because it's, the stakes are too high for that just to be simple casual fear. And why does the enemy do this? Because the greatest army in the world, you're looking at them. When you look at each other, you're looking at the greatest army in the world. You're looking at God's team, God's special forces, God's choice for revival. You're looking at God's best. And when you look into your own soul and your own heart, inside there, Jesus wants to take over so that God's best receives God's full reward, full will of God in your life. Otherwise, you'll never step out in faith. You'll do things in safety. You won't take risk. So I said, God, I'm done with this. From now on, I'm gonna be honest. If someone asks me a question, hey, did you see that movie? I remember I used to do that when people would say like, bro, we watched this movie. These leaders would talk about like these pastors. Yeah, we watched this movie and oh, it was amazing. Huh? And I'd go, <laughs> and in my head, I'm like, you've never seen the movie, Ben. Why are you nodding? You've never seen the movie. You're lying. Your nod is a lie. Don't lie. But I wanted to fit in. God said, from now on, just be genuine. Don't fear people's opinion. Love them. Don't try and suck up to people. Love them. Serve them. So you know what happened? I used to have this hook where I wanted Bill and Chris and everyone to recognize the anointing on my life. And I used to have a hook that tried to get them to value me. Once that was gone, guess what happened? Double honor entered my heart for them. Not rebellion, double honor. Do you know why? Because now I'm honoring the actual grace of God on them without trying to get it to always feed me. I actually became different. I became so genuine. People say, bro, do you like these shoes? I go, do you like them? Which was basically me saying no. <laughs> but before I would have gone, yeah, yeah, that's cool. And I'd be like, that guy looks like an idiot. 
<laughs> you wait till you see the shoes I wear tonight. You might think that of me. But I wouldn't be true. I wouldn't be honest. Hey, d- d- does, does everyone who doesn't believe in Jesus go to hell? Yes. Sadly, yes. But that's not the discussion. The discussion is why wouldn't you believe in Jesus if you can go to heaven? So many people have compromised. So much unholiness, so much fear of man, so much building God's house according to their own fears. That's why I love pastors Corey and Simone. I tell you, I travel all around the world and I don't like putting one against another. I never speak against churches. I don't like that at all. I I heard about Billy Graham's Modesto Manifesto where he said the four things God told them not to do. Don't take any money out of the events. Don't exaggerate the numbers. Don't be alone with women and don't speak against the local church. So I love the local church. I'm a pastor, huh? I'm a pastor now. (laughs) So now I know how it feels. But I really care for the local church. But I can tell you, traveling around the world 200 days a year, I speak at many places. Some people are afraid to pray in tongues. Some people are afraid to cast out a demon. Why are they afraid? Jesus did it everywhere. What Christianity are we reproducing? If there's a demon in your life today, a spirit of fear that cripples and controls you, what kind of a minister am I? If I just say, oh, just be blessed and go home with it. Have a great week. I'm sure you won't because you'll be constantly tormented and thinking about what everybody thinks of you. What kind of safe religion is that? So I said, God, break this out of me. So you know what he did? I remember getting on a plane. I was in Washington. You don't do this in all states of America. Washington is the wrong place. I was on the plane sitting there. I got upgraded to business class because I fly a lot. And I was enjoying the time. As the plane starts to go down, landing, running into Washington, D.C. airport or whatever it is, as it's coming into Washington, the Spirit of God says to me, puts a song in my head first, and I hear this song. It's an old hymn, right? Like, like an old one, like, oh, how I love Jesus, like that, you know, an old hymn. And then he says, stand up and sing that now. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, <laughs> oh, boy. I was like, <laughs> And I use my German words, nein. You know? Would you like God to disciple you this way? Some of you are like, "Mm -hmm. I'm just happy to be free of fear. I know, I know. But 2 Timothy talks about the man. It says, let the man that stole steal no more, but rather let him work and actually become a resource. So you can get forgiven, free of fear, and still do nothing. The thief is free of thieving, but he's actually supposed to become a resource. So the person that gets fear snapped off their life is actually supposed to become a person that imparts freedom and fearlessness. They're supposed to take risk. Otherwise, we still still sing that song, but we are a slave to fear. And we won't see people saved. We won't invite them to our house. Guys, if you just invite people to your house and go, hey, can we have dinner? Bring a sinner to dinner, okay? Just have, have dinner with them. Eat with him, and they're like, oh, dude, I hate this guy, blah, 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 it's my favorite, blah, blah, whatever. And he's just talking, he goes, bro, I hate that dude, and oh, I wanted to punch him in the head. Just go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that's great. And then just talk with him all the time, go, bro, can I pray for you at the end of the night? Most people won't say something like that. Pray for me? Nah, I mean, uh, are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. Sound like you're going through a hard time? Oh, yeah, oh, if you want, mate, yeah. And then you just pray, Father, I thank you for your love for him. Yeah. He's never felt that. There's no friend he has like that. And next minute, this literally happened to me. And next minute, there's a person standing in your house. This literally happened. My friend broke into my house at four in the morning because I wasn't answering the door when he was banging on the door. He wasn't saved. His wife left him. Guess who the first person he went to was? And he said, can you pray for me again? Pray for me? Only boldness, only freedom of human opinion can release that kind of lifestyle out of you. And, And God wants that, doesn't he? Because how is he going to save Australia? How is he going to save our country? It's the forced multiplication of God in all of us. That's how. But that doesn't happen. And we don't obey unless that fear is uprooted correctly and quickly. And, and after it's uprooted, you've got to begin to obey. You can take baby steps, but you've got to start stepping. So I'm on the plane, and I've just been praying, God, break it out of me. And he says, sing that song. And I'm like, I'm trying, I'm trying. And the plane goes down, and I don't get fearful a lot. But as it lands, I might, like, I'm literally shaking. And, I'm, and I stood up, and I'm like, <laughs> I looked at the plane, hey. And everyone's, like, getting their bag like this, looking at me. You know, no, no like, hey, 
just like this. And I said, uh, I'm going to sing a song right now. <laughs> and I said, some of you um, might think this is strange, but I feel like I'm supposed to sing this song about God. And I'm like, <laughs> and so, and no one's saying, oh, please, please, would you? Everybody's looking at me like, what is this idiot doing? Get him off the plane. And I'm right up the front near business class, which is even more embarrassing because these people, like their suit is worth more than my life, you know? And so I'm like this, I go, okay. And I start singing it like, and it was the worst song I've ever sung, literally. I don't know what happened, but usually I can hold a key sort of. I was like this, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, and the whole plane's like this. And about halfway like this, I'm like, oh, and I close my eyes. Oh, how I love Jesus. And then I hear two ladies singing it with me. Oh, and they start singing it, these two ladies. And then I was a little bit more like, how? Because he first loved me, you know, like that. And then I'm like, thank you. And then they all, the whole plane started clapping. And I turned around and the stewardess is there. You know, they wait, they look through the window to get the door. I'm like, tap the door thing, tap it, you know? And, and she opens the door and I bolted out of the plane. I bolted out. I ran up in the tarmac into the airport and tried to hide from anybody coming out of that plane. And I said, God, I was like, why would you have me do that? What's the fruit? What's the fruit? And he, <laughs> guess what is the fruit? Honestly, I'm like, why? Ah, you prayed, Ben. Make you free of the fear of man. Make you bold. And he said, I had you sing that old hymn because there was people on that plane that I know who heard that hymn as a child. And it said, I wanted you to sing it to bring the memory of how good I am back to those ears, back to those people. And so I said, thank you, Lord. But that was, okay, it's very wise of you, but don't do it again. <laughs> One time, can I tell you another story? Yeah. One time again, because I, I, I fly so much, they get, you get all these points and things. And, and so I was on a, uh, again, but business class, but not a, not a normal one. It was the international jet, you know? So it's like, it, it's blocked off that area. You can't sing to the rest of the plane or whatever. And, and I'm not boasting, guys. I, I, I could care less if it's business class or not. But what I'm saying to you is, it, I was very excited to be up there. And anyway, I sit next to this beautiful lady beautiful. She's wearing this kind of like, looks like one of those, you know, girls who wear those kind of like Prada, old Prada, like cost you $5,000 things, you know? You know the ones I mean, like all green, all whatever, and they have, they just look perfect. She looked like that. I look like this, but without this, without the Yeezys, I looked like I had, I had my, I had my Danny Nong tuxedo on, my tracksuit pants. And I had tracky pants, you know, Danny Nong tuxedo. Maybe some of you don't know what I'm saying there. But I have my Adidas tracky pants. And so this lady, hello, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm like, good. And it's a reclining seat like that. And I, and I put my ear things in and the Holy Spirit, Ben, I want you to preach in this business class. And I'm going down. I'm like, no, like really? Not now. I said, God, seriously, not now. I said, look at this lady. I said, we're taking off. We're taking off. I said, if I do it now, I get put down to economy for sure. <laughs> and he, I negotiated with God and he said, you've got to do it. And I said, can I at least do it when we land? He said, okay, God's merciful. <laughs> so when we land, we come down and again, the people, it's like a nine hour flight back to Europe and all these people are, you know, grabbing their stuff. And I'm like, hello, <laughs> hello. And what do you say there? You know, what do you say? You just say the truth. And I said, God, you've got to take over my mouth. I was praying under my breath before I did it. I said, God, take over my mouth. I don't know what to say to these people. So I said, hey, guys, sorry to bother you. So it was a wonderful flight. Hey, yes, you know, they're grabbing their stuff. And I said, hey, um, I just want to tell you something. I said, you may never see me again. What I didn't know is that there was a marshal on the flight. That's it. I'll tell you that another time. So <laughs> we had a little bit of a chat at the end. But, but I said, you may never see me again. I said, but there's a, and then God took over. Like that. I said, there's a God that loves you. And I said, every one of you standing up here, he knows your name. 
And I said, your sum total of your life isn't work, 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 and everything you did is just a two-inch signature at the bottom of a will. I said, that's not what you're worth, just to hand it all off to somebody else and die. I said, Jesus loves you enough to die for you. And I said, if you'd open your heart to him, he'll give you a brand new life. I preached the gospel in like one minute, but condensed, but I preached the gospel. And I said, you should turn your heart to God. And I said, and if you want, I'll pray with you. I'll talk to you outside if anybody wants prayer. Nobody said yes, but everybody was like this, in reverent silence. They listened. As I was heading out, this older lady, maybe 55, 60-ish, that's not really that old anymore, I'm like 40, so I'm like, this lady, (laughs) my big sister, um, (laughs) you know, (laughs) she walked through the, the, where you go to go out, and she looked me right in the eyes like this, and she caught my eye, and she just went, and I knew it was for her. The marshal wasn't keen, but she was. (laughs) I think the marshal said something to me like, why did you say you'll never see them again? because I'm getting off the plane. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You're laughing now, but in five minutes, those demons are gonna, it's gonna be wild in here. (laughs) Keep laughing for a few more minutes. Enjoy this moment. Because you're like, ha ha, God, how would you do that to a guy? And God's like, you're next. (laughs) Some of you are like, we're gonna drive, honey, to Sydney. We're driving. I don't do this every time I get on a plane. I don't like to boldly interrupt everybody everywhere I go. That's not my life. My life is to to minister to people and to help people and serve people. But the Spirit of God begins to just rip that source. And, And what's that source in you? Maybe it's not for people on the street. Maybe you're okay there. But maybe you change and adapt and you're a chameleon. You don't let anybody really see you. You don't let anybody really know who you are. That fear of man creates these walls, you know? It creates a a kind of like an artificial you that you can hide behind. People come to me all the time. They say, Ben, I feel I get rejected a lot. And I'm like, yeah, probably. I said, can I ask you a question? Like, how are you with people? And they're like, well, I I, I get afraid and, and, you know, I worry about what people think and I speak really bad. They've got these fears and worries attached to their own rejection. And I'm like, I know what you've done. You've made a pseudo you that God never made. So what happens is you're naturally going to be rejected because God didn't make that to be accepted, you see? So you can't be accepted if you're somebody else. So you're just going to perpetuate this cycle until you get over the fear of people's opinion. And you'll start to love and serve them differently. You'll start to honor your leaders more. You'll start to do it because you see the value of the kingdom of God on the earth and you'll see the value in people. You're less judgmental because you don't feel constantly judged. These revelations might seem cheap and small, but they're much deeper than you know. So Paul said this, He said, cursed is the man who trusts in man. And he said, he actually, the verse underneath says, he will be like a shrub in the desert. What's a shrub like? A shrub in the desert. Others come to me and say, Ben, I'm in a desert season. I say, how long have you been in there for? Nine months? A year? Now I ask new questions again. I say, what happened before you went there? Well, my boyfriend that I hoped would marry me, he broke up with me. And I go, there it is. The job that I thought I'd get, I didn't get. There it is. A pastor promised me I'd preach at a conference and then he forgot to invite me and did the conference anyway. I go, there it is. You've anchored your value and fed by man instead of God. And now you're in a wilderness. And I say to them, listen to me very carefully. And I say this gently to you too. Gently I say this. Because I'm not against someone going through a hard time. I've been through many storms. And God's a caring father. But many people are in a wilderness because they sent themselves there, not God. Jesus was sent by the father to the wilderness. And what happened in him? He became more resolved with God. He became stronger with God. So he came out, it says in Luke 4, with power. If you're in a wilderness and you're not coming out more powerful, it wasn't God who sent you there, it was you. That's simple. If you're not coming out with more authority in God, more freedom, more security in Jesus, more willingness to obey God, He didn't send you there. It was you who sent you there. So the wilderness you're in, how do you get out of it? You flip the switch on what you trust in. Say, okay, God, I'm done. I'm done pretending to be someone I'm not. 
I'm done living with this constant intimidation in me. I'm done with not saying what I truly believe. I'm done with not preaching when you say preach. I'm done with not seeing on the plane. Oh, we're all done with that, Father. But I'm not done. You know, I, I'm not going to be bo- uh, held back anymore. I'll be bold. Yeah. And bold might mean quiet. Come on. Yeah. Come on now. You might be like this, the, sh- the quietest person in the room. When you walk up to somebody, you say, hey, friend, God speaks to me. And he says, you haven't been sleeping for three months. And that person, you didn't know it, but that person leads a thousand churches. And then all of a sudden, they're weeping. I saw this in Bethel firsthand. They would take people to the prophecy booth. Six and seven-year-old kids were the ones that prophesied over those leaders. They purposely did that because the kid does not fear a title. The kid respects a grace, respects an anointing, but doesn't fear a person. So the kid would say, you were in your car four weeks ago and you broke down and you said, God, I quit the ministry. And the the senior leader would be bawling because the child would hear without fear. Well, whose child are you? You're not a child of everyone's opinion, are you? You're a child of God, right? We want to get this move of God on, but you've got to be honest. So here's what I want to do in this older call, because it will be an older call, and this will be wild. I can tell you right now, demons are going to come out. If you're uncomfortable with that, go read the New Testament out in the foyer. (laughs) Can we have some... Can we have some keys, please? Because sometimes if you play the key, like the demons, like people get, oh, yes, God, deliver me. The keys help the deliverance big time. (laughs) You know, do, do, do. Oh, yes, Lord. (laughs) Now I'm ready. (laughs) There we go. (laughs) I like joking with this stuff because, you know, sometimes people say, oh, you need this, you need that. I'm like, no, you you need the power of God. (laughs) But I like the keys because then you hear people, (laughs) I'm ready. And, ah. The Bible calls a spirit of fear, a spirit. Thank you. Can you take this, please? The Bible calls it a spirit. What does that mean? It means you might have been influenced with something that has controlled your way of thinking. It may not be in your spirit, but it might be attached to your thinking. I cast out many demons of Christians. Why? Some people say, why? How could a Christian have a demon? Well, I can show you in two minutes, but the thing that I really wanna highlight is this. The enemy works harder to attack you and me than the world. That's why people can start a business, start a tobacco company. They don't have the fear of man when they start these companies because the enemy's like, yeah, I'll just let them run in sin. We are trying to bring righteousness and enforce the heart of God and the will of God in the earth. So he attacks us. So if you have fear of man, if you manipulate who you are, if you feel you can't speak correctly, if you've changed who you are at any time and you feel you might've come under the influence of that or you can see that in your own life, you don't obey God when he says to do something. You're afraid of people in the street. You're not convicted for souls. You hold back your obedience from God. That's how you know you're controlled. And a big one is this. You think a lot through thoughts, social media, other things, texting, little combos. You think and meditate a lot on what people think and say about you. That's a really big one. That's the fear of man. And that snare today will be broken. But the only way it gets broken is when I feel the strength of the anointing right now. Literally, God's just going to kick demons out of people. The only way it gets broken is through vulnerability. And what that means is you come to God and say, I'm done with this. And if there's a spirit there, take it out of me, God. Get rid of it. And I know some people have that in their life here this morning. This will be such a pivotal thing for you as a church, as a conference, because many of you are just going to start obeying wildly. And it's going to be so beautiful. Not obeying recklessly, not obeying without wisdom, but are banging wildly like, God, yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'll buy that guy his coffee. Yes, I'll tell him Jesus loves him. You'll start saying yes a lot. So here's what this moment requires. I say to people, what would you rather? Five seconds of ah, or five more years of torment? What would you rather? Did you come to this conference to go, wow, that's a great message. Don't change me, Lord, don't change me yet. You don't have to go to Africa to be changed. You don't have to go to Africa to have a deliverance power moment with God. You can have it now, this morning. But you have to be real. And here's what that means. I want you to run, not walk. If you know you're under a stronghold of the fear of man and you wanna be free of that, get down to the front as fast as you can. Because you're gonna be set free. You're gonna be set free. And some of you, it's gonna be very powerful and it's gonna scare you a little bit. But God's gonna do a great work. 
Now what I need for this is I need the prayer team because you look, it's like 90% of the people. I need prayer team to help me. Can we just go a little less just for a second? So just the keys is good. But I've, I've done this a few times and, and what I see happen is people come down the front and there's a person near them and then what they do is while you're praying against fear and letting go of fear, you start to fear letting go of fear. It doesn't make sense if you fear what the guy next to you is thinking of you, does it? It makes no sense and it blocks the power of God off you because you want freedom, but you don't receive it because there's others around. Does that make sense to you? So what I'm saying to you is forget who's here and every evil spirit of fear is gonna leave you this morning. Now, I want you to pray this corporate prayer with me. Are you ready? Let's pray it out loud. Say, Father in heaven, we renounce any trust in man in a spirit spirit over God. God. Any misplaced trust, trust. any source from people people. that has become unhealthy, that has has hindered me from you, that has hindered my destiny. destiny. Today, I ask you to forgive me. me. And I ask you, you, do whatever it takes takes. by the power of the Holy Spirit Spirit. to kick the spirits of fear and mindsets of fear out of my life. I command you, Spirit. Get out now in Jesus' name. Now. You get out now in the authority of the name of Jesus. Get out of her now. Now. Get out of her life right now. I command you to leave. I break that spirit out of you. I need someone with me, please. I command you.